Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in 3, 2, 1. On this week's episode, has James Gunn saved the Suicide Squad? How Netflix may be on the next manifest? And are you ready to take a trip to a galaxy far, far away with Disney on a galactic cruiser. All this and more as we once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the pop culture cosmos. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos. Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos, Lakers Fast Break, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source, it is truly appreciated. I just want to give everybody a heads up out there. All you fantasy football fans, Inside Sports Fantasy Football is on its way back. We're looking forward to starting to record shows this week. So look out for it, not only on the Inside Sports Fantasy Football channel, but on the Pop Culture Cosmos channel as well. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without my good friend. He is our own con man from Humanica Media. You got to go ahead and check out what he's doing today at humanicamedia.com. Of course, all the work that he's been putting into popculturecosmos.com and whatever he's doing out there in social media and podcasting, including Topic Eclipse, the Super BS Games cast. And of course, he is the awesome author of this outstanding book, Congratulations, You Suck, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. You can find it right now in a digital or hardback form. It is my good friend. It is. Josh Peterson. What's up, man? What's up? Just got back. Was conning those comics, you know? Comic comic conning, comic comic con, comic came and went, you know? I I, I did the comic con. Comma 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 con. Um, you come and go. You Okay, sorry. Because you went to Bell County Comic Con near you, correct? Yes, yes, we did and yeah, it was it was a pretty cool place. It was a smaller con. Uh, you know, I had the usual suspects there. You had the lady that does the voice of Gohan. Sergeant Slaughter was there. Lou Ferrigno was there. Okay, so I met Lou Ferrigno once, and he's kind of a jerk. Oh, he, he, newsflash. He, yeah, he was mean. He's very mean. I don't know. He seemed like he was smiling today. I didn't, like, get in line to talk to him this time. But, you know, maybe he's nicer. But I just, like, didn't really have any desire to go shake the guy's hand again, you know? So I kind of avoided him. Well, because probably he's going to hulk out on you and just go, you know, turn green and, you know, maybe rip an arm off or two. So maybe it was good to stay away from him right there at the con. But you had a good time? Yeah, it was good. I met some artists. I don't know if you guys have read. There's this new comic called Something is Killing the Children. It's about this society that fights off nightmare creatures that are basically eating children in these like small towns. Oh, how nice. Yeah, so I met the artist there, and he signed a print for me. Also, he did one of the Power Ranger covers with the new Green Ranger, and so he signed that for me. So it was a pretty cool place. Other than that, like, there's a lot of, like, what we saw at Level Up Expo, you know, a lot of people um, just selling their wares. This was more of a trade fair than, you know, than some of the uh, some of the other things that we've been to in the past. And it was kind of cool. You got to see all the local stores come in and see what they got. It was fun. But we got a great show for everyone out there today. We're going to be talking about a lot of things, including our view of Suicide Squad. The Suicide Squad dropped this past weekend to the box office out there in theaters everywhere. Plus, also as well, 
to HBO Max. So we'll talk about the kind of response it's got, our review, and did it do well in the age of the pandemic right there at the box office. We'll talk about that coming up in a bit. We're also going to talk a little bit about what if, because what if that series, it drops this week. And I made a comment a couple of weeks ago that I did not think this was going to be for the general fan out there, the, the general Marvel fan, you know, somebody that doesn't stay up to date on everything that this was going to be necessary viewing. Do I change my mind on that? I'll have my thoughts, some revised thoughts on that coming up here in a bit. Manifest, a show that, why would I be talking about since it was canceled by NBC? It was a show that was middling in the ratings, really didn't make a big impression with a huge audience, but it made an impression with the right audience. So much so that its appearance on Netflix has caused quite a stir. How big of a stir? And can that lead to a possible fourth season of Manifest on Netflix? We'll talk about the demand on Manifest on Netflix coming up later in the program yeah, as we're well. We're all for another season. Okay. Do you, okay. See, that? Well, Do you see what I did? That was good. Yeah, there you go. All right. You're that welcome. Was, that was really good. All right, ladies that and gentlemen, was... thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Oh, no, no, not yet. There's still <laughs> plenty more to go. We're also going to be talking about Squish Mallows. That's right. Squish Mallows. Why would we want to talk about Squish Mallows? We'll tell you why this could be the next hot pop culture property coming up here in a bit. Plus the controversy behind Jeopardy's hosts. And Josh, I'll ask him if he's ready to go on a Disney Star Wars Galactic Cruiser coming up on the back end of the show as well. But first, my friend, it is the big ticket of the day, and that is Suicide Squad, the Suicide Squad, James Gunn's new vision for the IP. As you and I both know, we, we at the time, we saw the original Suicide Squad movie, David Ayer's movie, and regardless of the fact you want a new cut of it, and David Ayer's has a lot more footage, and there's an Ayer's cut, regardless, it was similar to what the kind of results we saw for what we saw with Justice League originally. When it dropped, it was bad. It was a bad movie all the way around. It just we, we did not have good thoughts on it, but tune in five years later. And the Suicide Squad drops to marvelous reviews. I know I'm, I'll be talking in the near future to Noe and Fine, and he absolutely loves it. And I will go ahead and you know speak to him on that when I get a chance. But my friend, we're going to be dropping spoilers on Suicide Squad here in a bit. But I want to get your initial thoughts on Suicide Squad. It was a very uncomfortable movie. It, it, okay. it I don't know. It just it made me feel weird watching it. I don't know why. And I don't know, like, what I felt when I was at the end of it. But I still don't know if I liked it. It's It felt like a, um, it was like a Robert Rodriguez film. That's what it felt like. It felt like a, a Robert Rodriguez film with, you know, like, superheroes and kaiju. Okay. It did have its own style. I will give it that. It did have its own style. I, I appreciate the fact that it was uh, very much out there. I liked the film a lot. I didn't think it was as great as IGN is claiming it. I think it is one of the best movies of the year. I think it's a very good movie. I don't think it's a great movie. I know that the cast itself, uh, you know, a lot of the members of the cast don't get too attached, as James Gunn has already said. Director James Gunn has indicated that he kills off several of the characters. And within the first 10 minutes... He does kill off several of these yeah. characters. Yeah. So. yeah, so that was I that I don't know. Like I wasn't really attached to a lot of those characters. I I was kind of upset about Jai Courtney. Like I like I liked Captain Boomerang a lot. So it kind of bummed me out that they would off him so soon in the movie. You know, like the other uh, the other characters, I weren't. I they don't they don't really give you a lot of background. You don't have a history with the other characters, so you don't really like feel anything when they die. I know they had. You know, Nathan Fillion's character and what was that YouTuber Fluga was on there. Yeah. He was the, the guy with the spear. Um, Pete Davidson. Yeah. And the thing with the weasel was funny because it just it really just didn't serve a purpose. And then Michael Rook's character. Yes, Michael, Michael like, Rooker. Rook, yeah, like that 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 whole thing didn't make any sense to me. I don't know. It just like it felt gratuitous in a way. I think it was just to show people out there that anything for the rest of the movie can happen as far as characters are concerned, whether they lived or they died. But yeah, just basically offing all the characters and having Harley Quinn and Rick Flagg, part of those individuals that were supposed to lead this team, 
this ill-fated team, basically sending them there to die, i.e. the Suicide Squad, you know, and having those two only the ones that are living, everybody else seemingly died as far as it's concerned in the beginning. And I, I, of course, they, they found the most appropriate song to have them die to. But I just think of that for the rest of the movie, yeah, I thought what there was, was good and was really solid. In fact, like I said, I, I give about an eight. I think, I think it's probably where I'm at, eight, close to an eight and a half, but around, right around an eight, I'll give it. Okay. I think Idris Elba is having the best year of any actor that's out there for the movies between this and Concrete Cowboys, which is now, or at the time, Variety has said it's their top movie of the year. And, and I know he's gotten great raves for that performance. I think he's having an outstanding year. I thought he was just truly brilliant in this role. John Cena, I think, was a, a very welcome addition playing yeah. Peacemaker. What are your thoughts on John Cena playing Peacemaker? So, because his, his, his shtick, since he's left the WWE, well, since he's taken off as far as a full-time member of the WWE, has been hit or miss. I think this was really on point. Yeah, so I I I enjoyed the the back and forth with him and uh, Idris Elba. I yeah. I, I like the competition, you know, where they're talking about how like you know he it opens that that scene with him going, "What does this guy do?" And he goes, "He can turn anything to a weapon, but that's what I do. Yeah, but I do it better." Like they open up with that cont that like immediate rivalry between one another, and that was fun. You know, I enjoyed seeing that happen. And you kind of know that, like, uh, what's his name? John Cena's character is someone who he's he's fun. No, he's he's kind of a fun guy. He's kind of, he's a fun character, but he's also not compromising. Whereas the yeah. rest of them are very compromising in what they'll do. Like John Cena is a very he, his uh, peacemaker is a very black and white character. Yeah, I can't do this because this will happen. Where uh, where other, everyone else is like, oh well, I mean. There's a lot of gray area with everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're kind of like go with the flow type people, whereas John Cena is looking at a bigger picture. So, you know, that's an interesting contrast to see between him and Idris Elba's character. I flag. I like seeing him come back. I was kind of bummed about you know what they did to him. So here, if, if I can break down my couple things about the film, it was funny. You know, it, it was funny. It was gratuitous. Uh, the stuff with the polka dot man, you know, like that was fun. You know, and I liked how when they were trying to uh, rescue Flag, they ended up like killing the wrong group of people. But I, I guess like some of my big beefs with the movie is that it, the, the moments where it was supposed, you know, they tried to insert some serious stuff in there. Like the whole movie felt like a joke. You know, it felt like the way that like Crank 2 was filmed and like Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. I forget what that guy's name was, yeah. where like. The movie doesn't take itself serious. Yeah. And when I'm watching things like that, I have a hard time taking it serious because even the serious stuff they tried to inject into the film felt so forced and cheesy. It felt forced and cheesy, and it just felt like it didn't belong in this film where people are literally getting like tops of their heads chopped off, you know, and like people are having buildings fall on them while they're smiling. Like it just didn't feel like it belonged. Like they're trying to juggle these tones, and it just didn't really work that well but again i will say that it's better than the first suicide squad movie oh i think it's infinitely better than yeah. the first suicide squad i think it's like i said for me it's a good film i i don't think it's as great as as ign and some other outlets are making it to be like nines nines and a half so i see this out there but a good solid eight for me yeah i was disappointed at starro the conqueror being the you know aka the kaiju in this film and having him out and about and wreaking havoc for all of five minutes before he's already done away with. And I thought that was pretty sad that to see you built this up and you have this potentially what could have been this great villain and this great monster that could threaten society and humanity. Yeah. And you did basically nothing with him. I think that was a, to me, the biggest disappointment and the fact that he could control minds, uh, you know, by throwing the little starfish out of all these people and, and, didn't really do anything with him. He, you know, all the cities, you know, all all the people, all the town folk, all the army was controlled by by Starro for all of five minutes, and you just had them walking around. And that's it. When you could have yeah. done so much more with them, you know, as far as the mindless zombie thing is concerned. So I was really disappointed as far as the Starro representation on that. And I get the fact that the biggest villain of all in the movie is the actual government of the United States. And, and I get that that's the fact that they knew about the project, the Starro project all along, 
and we're helping fund it and all that. I get that they're the biggest villain ultimately, and Amanda Waller is trying to you know prevent the secrets from getting out there and and you know all that. But to me, I would have loved to have seen Starro at least wreak havoc a little bit more. Yeah, do you know what that scene with Starro reminded me of? It reminded me of this the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in Ghostbusters. 2. Yeah, like he just fumbles around the city a little bit breaks things steps on cars you laugh and at some explodes. of it yeah but he and he, he even went so far as to like waddle around like a toddler in the same way that the the marshmallow man did in ghostbusters like it felt like this scene was almost ripped exactly from that movie and, yeah, uh, and that, that to me was the that was, to me was the most disappointing for me yeah it was not very uh it was it was anticlimactic you know and especially the way that the the starfish w- or what's his name the star lore star fish oh starro starro the way that he dies you know like that was just it i don't know i would have liked to see a little bit more like action a little bit more of them like working together and instead they took that moment where he's attacking the city to kill off more of the suicide squad like it just it became tiresome at that point you know like when there could have been, and I know, I know. At some point, you got to go ahead and make Ratcatcher number two because she was an integral part of the team to, to prove her value and prove her worth. But yeah. I was hoping that it would be done at some other point in time. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. It, it was, I don't know. It, it had a lot of misfires. It had a lot of things that worked. It was just a very weird movie. There's not a lot of movies that I would describe as weird and uncomfortable, but this movie was weird and uncomfortable just for the fact that like it doesn't stick to any norms at all. So if you're like going to see this movie, don't expect it to stick within the boundaries of what you know this universe or really any film universe has written so far. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. So let me get this straight. We're going to play a like a video game together or Well, not exactly. Okay, fine. W- where's the controller? Oh, uh, that's it's it's right here. This is literally a sheet of paper. I don't understand what you Here, re- you're going to need these two. Dice? You just had Are these even dice? We are going to play Vampire the Masquerade. It's a role-playing game. What kind of vampire do you want to be? Okay, now you're telling me there's more than one kind of vampire? Oh, my friend, you have no idea. There's an Osferatu, there's Vampires and Vitae, an actual play podcast. Season 2, coming soon to Pop Culture Cosmos. Any last thoughts on it? If you were to give it a grade. So I would give it a, I I would say like a 7.5 or an 8. You know, I'm still like trying trying to decide where it stands. And maybe I just need to watch it again, but like... It it was not, it was not my favorite. Like, and it might be because I watched it late at night. But well, IGN was phrasing it. The dude who was reviewing it for IGN, and I use keep referencing him because he was just so glowing, saying this is the best DC movie ever. And I I'm like, ah, I, I, so. I still like the Joker. I still like the Joker. Uh, okay, so let me ask you this: Like, DC has a lot of things in the pipeline. You know, like they have the Aquaman two, Shazam, Black Adam, the the Batman, the alleged. Superman reboot. I, so, wh- where do you see the DC EU going? The DC, the extended DC film universe. Where do you see that going outside of their little multiverse projects? Because I feel I don't even think they know. I don't even I don't, think they have a clear, clear definition. I, I don't think they do either. Because we need, you know, the the connecting fabric here is the Justice League, and they're like so prideful about not wanting to be, bring Snyder back into the fold that they're refusing to to look at these other characters and i'm curious to see if the flash like dismantles everything that's been done already or what or if he you know reconnects things in a way that they didn't that they weren't like going to be connected before but it just it seems to me like they're they need they need the big the bigs you know they need batman and superman in some form to, to keep pushing this universe forward otherwise it just it feels kind of pointless to have connected them all in the beginning and then just have everything spread apart and then not have any like fabric that ties it all together even though they exist in the same universe well the movie itself opened unfortunately below expectations which i think is a little bit more representative of the world we live in right now with the delta variant and things scaring people from going out and really going back to movies and the the increasing number of cases and all that. And I don't want to get you know. I know people are just checking out the news to understand all that, but 
I think that's weighing in on the box office, plus the fact it was day and date with HBO Max. I'm hoping it was a big hit for HBO Max because I think that James Gunn has saved the Suicide Squad. So he, he you know, now it's pretty cool to bring them back. I understand that you may not have the highest of opinions on it, but it sounds like you did enjoy it. You did like parts of it. And that is something that it could be a positive sign to come back to later in the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I I would not mind revisiting the franchise. It just wasn't it wasn't anything that I was prepared to watch, <laughs> if, if that makes sense. What are your thoughts out there on The Suicide Squad, now in theaters and on HBO Max? We want to hear your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, my friend, there's still more to talk about on today's episode. I wanted to hit you up on this, and that is What If? It comes out this week. I had mentioned in recent statements on a show I did a couple of weeks ago that I did not think this was required viewing, but since then, the producers behind the series have said that even though this is an animated series, that there will be characters that could become part of the live action Marvel Cinematic Universe at some point in time. Let's say like, let's take for instance, I'm not saying this is for sure or anything, but let's say like Party Thor. In the trailers, there's a Party Thor, dude, bro, you know, that type of deal. There could be a situation down the line is what they're implying that maybe Party Thor a.k.a. Chris Hemsworth in a party Thor type of role could be coming out of a certain part of the multiverse at some point in time down the road to MCU. That's what they're implying, that some of these characters in the What If series, because What If is going to be canon, and it's going to be canon to the MCU. So I'm going to correct my statement and say, you know what, if you get a chance and watch it, I think you should. So I yeah I had read that they're, they're interested in exploring Captain Britain uh, the the Peggy Carter version of Captain yeah. America, and that that Captain Britain actually has like some long running comic books out there though it's it you know it's a male I forget who it is in the comic books but it's a, it's not Peggy Carter but you know right now like it, this is and maybe I just need to see how it is but I don't like multiverses like I I feel like multiverse is just like it's a clever way of like being able to craft stories outside of your continuity but then it's also like drawing characters from different multiverses into a main set of films I just like it's exhausting because now like as someone who has story OCD I feel like I have to go and watch every single one of these. I have not even watched Loki yet. And now What If is coming out. And I got to sit there and watch that. And then, you know, I want to catch up on all these before Chang chi comes out. Which I'm probably, you know, looking at the dates right now. I'm probably not going to be able to do. So I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm not excited. Just because, like, I feel like now I'm being forced to watch all these things that I don't have time to do. Like, I, I love just having, you know, I've talked about this before. But I love just having the movies because... There's no pressure to sit down and watch them every night, you know? Well, I certainly hope that you get the chance to check out the Loki series because I do think it's the best of the three series, and that's my personal opinion on that. I hope also as well you get a chance to check out Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings when it comes out in early September. Because that's something I'm definitely looking forward to. And the What If series is going to be coming out this week and for several weeks, even after Shang-Chi is released. So... I'm looking forward to seeing What If, and you know, since it's part of canon now for the MCU, I guess I, like you said, you now have to have OCD, and if you have the Marvel OCD, you got to go ahead and check it out. I will have my first review of the first episode of What If. It will be on the PCC Multiverse on Friday, so I'm looking forward to talking with Jamie on that show, so we'll go ahead and share our thoughts on the first episode of What If. But before we head to the break, my friend, and the rest of this program, I want to go ahead and hit you up with this Manifest on Netflix. Manifest was a show, three seasons on NBC. Middling ratings had a nice concept of basically people on a plane flight. They get lost. They disappear for like, what, three, five years? Was it five years? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Five years. They come back and a whole world's changed to them and. Everybody looks at them weird and they talk, interact and just the interaction, whole things like that, the whole nine yards. And then also the fact that because they were gone five years, the, you know, the forces of nature are trying to work against them on that because it, you know, something's not entirely right with this whole thing. And this concept, again, manifested was a 
decent show, decent ratings wise, but not to the point where NBC wanted to keep it. So they canceled it after three seasons, but they also handed the show over to Netflix to show back episodes. And it in such sheer demand has manifest and the, the fans, the ardent fans behind manifest have been so adamant on getting Netflix to showcase another year, another season of manifest that they've kept manifest at the top of Netflix ratings uh, week after week after week. So your thoughts, because it is now coming to the point where it looks like it looks like that manifest may be getting a second life. I know that the producers behind manifest and Netflix have been communicating with each other about a possible next season. So that's gotten everybody that's behind the show. As far as fans are concerned, really looking forward to a possible fourth season of manifest. You know, it's interesting that Netflix, it seems to like be the place where shows go to get revived, right? We had Lucifer, we have manifest, um, what was the one, the 100 was the 100 yes. one of those shows. I don't well, I thought the 100 was put back on CW. Oh, okay. Just... All right. Yeah. I mean, I know there's been a couple others, but it seems like Netflix is a place where shows are getting like a second life. And it, it, it's weird because if you think about this, these shows weren't getting good ratings when they were on cable TV, but they're getting good ratings and views on Netflix. So what, is this, what does this tell you? Well, this tells me a lot and that it tells me that it's going to be something that Netflix has a lot of power. It just shows you the increasing power of Netflix within the Hollywood community. I mean, yeah. they're they're not a joke anymore. 200 million subscribers plus around the world for Netflix. They're certainly not a joke anymore. And if somebody if there's a show or a series or a movie that people really like, it's going to dictate the numbers and that's going to tell Netflix with that seemingly endless amount of cash or credit line that they keep on rolling up that they're going to go ahead and take notice real quickly. Yeah, but I mean, what does this tell you about where the viewers are at, though? Like specifically, the, the, this, you know, we're we're at this. Hey, where were these? Where was this group of people? Is that what you're saying? Where was this group of individuals? That huge audience for this. Where were they at? On and why were they not watching NBC? It, exactly. So this is you know we're at this weird like crossroads in streaming culture where like people are not streaming culture, but but shows, right? Television, movies, whatever it might be. People are stuck you know there's people still trying to decide between streaming and cable well it just seems to me like that they're now choosing streaming right and that they're just waiting for these shows to get tossed off to a streaming outlet and that's when they'll watch them right so i would be curious to know like if you know if say like the cw or usa or whatever you know with their streaming platforms coming out will their shows get more views? Like these shows that are on the edge of cancellation, will they get more views, whether it's via Peacock or, you know, whatever else is out there, will they get more views? And if they don't, you know, it, it might show that the viewers are all at Netflix. I don't know. But I mean, it's just, this is what this is telling me is that people aren't watching cable television anymore. Or even broadcast television. Or even broadcast television. Yeah, this is like the streaming outlets. It's sad to say, I mean, not sad, but to cable, you know, people who are... It is sad. It is sad. You know, people who are into cable and broadcast, like what this is showing is that the people aren't there anymore. Things aren't being consumed. So are these big broadcast stations, are they going to keep pumping money into content if nobody's watching them? Or are they going to just take all their shows off primetime TV and put their shows, their original content, straight onto streaming platforms. We'll have to wait and see. But, I mean, these dramas, like Manifest, they're not cheap to make, my friend. So in doing so, these broadcast companies like ABC, NBC, CBS, they may reevaluate what they're doing and right. just say, you know what, in CBS's case, we'll wait until we can go ahead and put it on Paramount+. Plus. And now you're seeing with NBC, NBC could do the same thing. They see what happened with Manifest and they didn't have the rights to go ahead and keep it they, instead of put it on Peacock. Now it looks like Netflix may end up getting a four season. These shows that are on NBC, now they realize they may make sure to, to lock it up and make sure that they go ahead and put it on their own network. So it will find the same success, hopefully on their network, because Peacock is now around 50 million with all of its different subscribers, whether it's free or pay tiers. And then you have ABC 
having Hulu and Disney Plus since they're all owned under the Disney family. So this, I think, is a big wake-up call to these broadcast outlets to say, you know what, if we have dramas that really cost a lot of money to produce and they're not really gaining the kind of popularity that it's justifying it on broadcast, we may look to showcase them on streaming outlets going forward. Yeah, or like another good idea would be until the audience is established, like put it and they're going to try new properties, give it to Netflix for a couple seasons. And then once that contract is up and people are still watching it on Netflix, put it onto your own streaming platform. That way you know that it was worth the money and you, then you can build on production from there. Absolutely. And we'll talk about more about big deals for streaming and everything going on with another long-standing show coming up after the break. But what are your thoughts out there on Manifest? Are you a big supporter of Manifest? And were you watching the show on Netflix that's made it so popular now? But were you supporting it or not supporting it when it was on NBC? We want to hear your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, coming up next, we got still a ton of stuff to talk about, including South Park's Big Deal, Squish Mollos, a Jeopardy host has been kind of thought about, but the internet's not liking it. And also, will Josh take a trip on a galactic cruiser? We'll talk about that on the back end of the show. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. If you want to see the coolest action figure collections out there, the stuff that you played with as a kid, hear from industry insiders that made the toys that really, truly defined who we are, then you got to check out season one of Action Figure Adventure. Check out Action Figure Adventure now, exclusively at Big Bad Toy Store. You'll get 10 episodes of awesome action figure fun. I guarantee if you grew up playing toys, you will love Action Figure Adventure. And we're back with the show. It's the Pop Culture Cosmos. It's Gerald Glassford along with my good friend, Mr. Josh Peterson. Want to mention again at two, I do this every week. And please, if you are a tabletop RPG fan, we have a ton of tabletop RPG games out there. Check out our Facebook page, Pop Culture Cosmos, where not only we post the latest news and trends in pop culture, but five, six days a week sometimes, we have the best in tabletop RPG gaming because we're the number one tabletop RPG streamer on Facebook. You can even check out our Twitch channel, Pop Culture Cosmos, and YouTube as well. My friend, before we head on out, we've got a lot of things to talk about, including South Park. South Park just inked a nine, did you hear hear me on this, man? A $900 million deal to continue the show on Comedy Central through season 30, plus an additional 14 standalone, let's say, here, here again, 14 standalone movies that will be on Paramount+. Plus. So I want to hear your thoughts, my friend, on this. This is a huge win for Trace Parker and Matt Stone, the guys who've been doing this show for so long. This has been one of the staples of pop culture now for 25 years. It just seemingly is just cannot stop. It just it always touches on various aspects of our lives in a good and very sometimes controversial and funny way. But your thoughts on South Park's big deal. Yeah, this is crazy. I mean, it just goes to show like South Park is still culturally relevant. And it's funny because South Park is allowed to say all say and do comment on all the things that we're not allowed to. Right. So it just goes like it is culturally relevant. Like people still want to be called out by South Park. And that's kind of funny to me, because otherwise, if people didn't like South Park, you know, it would not have been signed on for so many seasons and nine movies like that's that's a big deal. And it, and originally when I when I read about this, I was thinking to myself, like, that's a lot of work. But then, you know, I remember Trey and Matt coming out on stage during the uh, Ubisoft press conference at E3. Was it back in 2017? And he made a joke about how, like, oh, I got to go. You know, we got three hours to put the next South Park episode together. So it must not take a lot of production time for these things to come together. So, yeah, you know, good for them, man. Good for them. Like, again, South Park is... I would say it's more culturally relevant than The Simpsons and Rick and Morty. Like it has become a staple of American entertainment. And that's that's well, saying a lot for such like a crass show that was designed to make people feel bad about themselves. <laughs> well, you and I have probably come in and tuned out and gone in and tuned right. out just like with yeah. The Simpsons on the, on the series. We don't catch every episode anymore. 
just seems seemingly the ones that touch on the most controversy seemingly but when it comes to the movies that's me is the biggest thing is the 14 standalone movies that they're going to be yeah. doing with paramount because and people laugh at me when i say this the best movie musical i've ever seen in my entire life is south park bigger longer and uncut because of the fact it was so original the songs yes controversial and whatever it touched on it touches on but it just seemed to me it was so well crafted and so well done that you know if you look at it objectively content aside and you look at it objectively at how well it was crafted and manufactured it was a real well done movie and a real well done musical and to see them given the opportunity to do over a dozen more for all intents and purposes, they could go even more overboard than they do on Comedy Central. Yeah, and I, when you know when they say movie, I think we're going to be looking at like Dragon Ball movie size movies. You know, things that are like forty-five to sixty yeah. minutes instead of like you know your typical hour and a half to two-hour runtime. So basically, I, I think these these films are going to be like extended episodes, which is good because I feel like you know if you sit down and watch an episode of South Park, there's more that you know these guys clearly want to say. And there's just not enough time in that like 22 minute slot to say it. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And kudos to both Trey Parker and Matt Stone for doing such an outstanding job over the years. And congratulations on your big deal with Paramount, CBS, Viacom, Comedy Central, the whole nine yards, what you had to go ahead and sign the contracts to, because that's a ton of money coming your way. And for everyone out there in pop culture, I think that we could probably say whether you like them or you don't like them, they have defined a part of our pop culture for decades now and are certainly going to be a part of our pop culture in the years to come. What we all want, though, is basketball, too. So, I mean, you know, if you could put that into the Paramount deal, <laughs> I think I think we'd all be pretty happy. That was pretty good, but I like World Police better. Yeah, to me, it was better. Yeah, yeah, that's that's I don't know. Like basketball was like it, it took all the things that were like cheesy. Team America about, World Police. Oh, uh, Team America World Police was funny. I yeah, I ba- basketball I guess was funny because you actually got to see what the guys who make South Park look like, you know, and they're they're, yeah. they're talented, you know, they can kind of act and they can write funny things. So it was it was a good movie. What are your thoughts out there on the big humongous deal? Bigger, longer, uncut, I should say, deal that they made with Paramount, Viacom, Comedy Central, and whole nine yards, 900 million strong, plus going through season 30 for the great show, South Park. And then they're going to go ahead and add on 14 standalone shows straight to Paramount Plus. Please share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. My friend, there's still much more to talk about on today's program. Wanted to ask you this. Are you familiar with Squishmallows? I am not. I feel like you're describing like Squidward as a marshmallow. That's what I'm no, no, envisioning no. this as, or Squidbillies on Adult Swim. Well, you've got some kids in your life, my friend, that are younger than mine. So you're just going to ask them what is a Squishmallow, and they'll probably tell you nonstop what it is. But it is becoming the latest entry into the toy lines that's going to get a lot more and the reason why i say that is because variety reported that they just the makers behind squish models have just signed a deal with caa which is the largest and most prominent pr agency in hollywood and the goal is to get them more out there not only just extend the toy line and the plush toys that they are even more but for media, yeah, as Josh is showing the Squishmallows right there for you, they're so cute. They're, they're so cute. They're pillows. But, well, they're pillows, but they're they're Squishmallows, man. You, you got to squish them. You got to enjoy them. But anyways, they're going to <laughs> they're going to go ahead and expand the Squishmallow empire to include some type of media, whether it's television shows, movies, but also video games. And that really got me interested. And when that was mentioned right off the bat, that just tells you that this could be a staple of kids' culture for in the years to come. We're already seeing the fruits of labor for those behind the Paw Patrol, because in a couple of weeks, the Paw Patrol movie will come out to theaters and also Paramount Plus simultaneously. And I think 
because of what we saw was with the Suicide Squad. I'm not expecting much financially at the box office for it, even though it looks to be something a lot of kids will want to go and see. I'm looking that, that it will provide a big boost for Paramount+. Plus. But what are your thoughts on a new entity like this? Because we've seen with all the different collectibles and toys out there getting so much run right now. And we've even seen where a copy of Super Mario has gotten a what a sealed copy was $2 million, if I'm not mistaken, where collectibles are now at an all-time high in pop culture and in our society. So your thoughts on Squishmallows getting this type of deal and this type of love? The last toy fad that my kids talked about was uh, Twisty Pets. That was the last thing that I had heard about. Squishmallows, I'll have to ask them if they know what that is. I, this is new to me. Uh, it, it seems like it could be the next Beanie Babies, I guess, like if they end up getting partnerships with different things. I know I saw at the mall they had like Pokemon plushies selling for like 60 to $70 a piece, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it, When's the last time you walked on a toy aisle in like Walmart or Target? Yeah, actually, it was two days ago. So, no, it was yesterday. Sorry. So you walk down these toy aisles, and what you notice is that... IP after IP after IP after, after IP. IP. But what you notice, especially with all these IPs, is that there's nothing on the shelves. Because adults are buying toys now for themselves, and they're just putting them away, hoping that one day they'll be worth something. And I think that's a good investment, but it's like... Well, well you just saw, like I said, $2 million broke the record for video games for sealed copy of Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, you could look on eBay, all the value of retro games have, like, skyrocketed. You know, there's a unopened black label Final Fantasy VII went for, like, $17,000. Like, I've never, never seen that before in my life. This is the new, the new stock market is assets. There's even like apps you can buy where you can buy shares in assets now. Like, you know, what this GME and AMC thing has revealed is that the stock markets are, they're rigged, basically. They, or they seem like they're rigged. So now people are, are moving their assets or their money into assets. And, you know, if you look at the value of, say, like a Power Ranger toy from 1994, I was trying to buy a Dragon Zord today at the Comic Con, and they were trying to sell it to me for three hundred dollars. Whereas you could buy it for thirty. Like toy values do go up, and with these Squishmallows, if they have anything like the, you know, if they're anything like the Beanie Babies, then yeah, well, probably if you buy a bunch and they end up staying popular, you could probably see a return on your investment within the next couple of years. What makes me so angry, my friend, sometimes is that, you know, I'm fifty-two. So that means I lived through the 80s and 90s, you know, later on as an adult in the late 80s and early you know, 90s. And I was working at, at the good guys in an electronic retailer that sold video games on the side. It was not their primary deal, but it sold them on the side. And I remember a lot of these Nintendo 64 copies, because this was mid-90s when I was working there. And this is when Nintendo 64 and some other well-known consoles of the time genesis and things of that nature mm -hmm. that's when you would see copies of this and i remember like for instance clay fighter i remember that being on clearance and we couldn't get rid of that and that was a sealed copy and i think to myself now i'm like oh my god i could have yeah. had clay fighter n64 sealed and i could have gotten that for like under 20 bucks and look at it now and you I know, like for instance, Virtual Boy, I could have had a sealed Virtual mm -hmm. Boy. And just knowing what I know now, I wish I had known that. Oh, absolutely. Like, I remember being a kid and going into Toys R Us and seeing Earthbound, right? A sealed copy of Earthbound for 40 bucks. I could have picked that up, kept it till now, and I could have made a good, you know, I could have made several you know, i don't even know what seven it was, figures seven, uh, not that's yeah, maybe the, not seven but six figures six thousands figures. thousands of dollars on yeah. it yeah like it's it's absolutely insane you know like i was talking to a buddy of mine i'm like do i wish that i had the hindsight to buy two of everything when i was a kid because all this stuff power rangers a booster pack of the original pokemon cards are they're selling on ebay for about six hundred dollars a piece and th <laughs> that's what people are bidding on them for so it's not even what they're actually selling for like, I just wish I had the hindsight to purchase two copies of things. I mean, you know, granted, I can't, but it's just I, I can't go back in time and change things. But, you know, it's kind of like when my dad says that he wishes as a kid that he could have bought, like, he had all these classic cars as a kid, and he just wished that he had kept them because now they're 
value has like you know tripled or quadrupled so hindsight's awful but yeah i do wish that like now i had not gotten rid of so many things over the years because a lot of it could be worth a lot of money right now and you know what's funny is that everyone thought that the that the kenner run of star wars toys like the second run that came out in the 90s was going to be worth a lot of money but that stuff's not it's all like the cheap stuff that nobody like wanted to buy at the first the first run and then also the cardboard pre-order you know thing that everybody seems to like clamor for because you know it was promising you bought a basically a piece of cardboard telling you that the actual figures would be on the way right and even that is extremely valuable so yeah. it's so funny how how things you know, our value in society and on what we think what we value and what we evaluate is either worthless or not so worthless and Ah, oh, Squishmallows could be the thing where in 10, 15, 20 years, people be paying big money for Squishmallows. So we'll see what happens. But Squishmallows is the next big thing, I think, if for kids' toys. At least that's what CAA, the big yeah. PR agency, is banking on. So I want to hear your thoughts, parents out there, moms and dads. If you know Squishmallows or if you're looking to collect some Squishmallows, please let us know why. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Don't touch that dial. Wait, do, do people still use dials? If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis. But before we head on out, my friend, a couple last things to touch on, and Jeopardy. Jeopardy may have found its new host because Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and Deadline were all reporting that they might have come to agreement or they were in extensive negotiations with one of the executive producers on the show, Mike Richards, who been there for years as behind the scenes, also has hosted other game shows in the past, looking to see if they can get him as the official full-time replacement for the late Alex Trebek. And I know other people in the industry have thought maybe Ken Jennings, the big winner and the all-time biggest winner for Jeopardy, who has been a, also a guest host coming on. They think about him as a full-time but both of them have been sought out as far as some backlash from the internet with the internet posting a lot of things that they have said or done in the past as far as evidence that maybe they shouldn't be the host. Personally, I thought internet favorite and an individual who was on there for a week or a few day, a few shows, LeVar Burton, who we all know from Star Trek The Next Generation and also Reading Rainbow. I thought he was terrific in the role, and I personally recommend him. That would be my first choice. But your thoughts on this Jeopardy controversy as far as what ultimately may happen? I think they're just going to go with this Mike Richards guy ultimately, but I'm hoping that they don't. Yeah, I like LeVar Burton. You know, I saw Mike Richards since he doesn't literally like look... Like he's got he doesn't move of, the needle. No, he doesn't look like he's got the charisma required to host Jeopardy. You, you know, and like as for the other things, like you know, we're eventually going to have to reach a point where the internet stops like getting in the way of like these companies making decisions. You know, like it's they just have too much power, and who cares, honestly? Like if if this is the decision the studio makes, and that's their business, you know, it's not like people are going to stop watching Jeopardy because I feel like uh, most of the people who watch it don't really care that much about. Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I mean, we've seen in Marvel where somebody says, Oh, I'd really love to be a Marvel superhero and the internet gets (laughs) totally behind them. Yeah. And you see Marvel just say, no, we're going in a different direction. And same thing I'm, I'm going to assume with Jeopardy is that the internet and, you know, public opinion are leaning one way. And ultimately I'm assuming Jeopardy is going to lean the other. And it just, it seems like sometimes I understand with cancel culture and things of that nature in the internet, but sometimes, man, you have such a sheer popularity for an individual like LeVar Burton 
or like individuals for the Marvel Universe, that maybe it's the best idea to just run with it because it would sustain the popularity of the IP that you have. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm just saying that like if you, the Internet is saying like, oh, so and so has a shady past. Like, who cares? They're not that person anymore. Let's see what they can do, given the opportunity to do something good for people. You know, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. But I think like LeVar Burton. Yeah, I'm totally behind LeVar Burton. But again, like it's not, you know, at the end of the day, the studio gets to decide like it should be their choice, what they think is going to be best for the brand moving forward. Because as we saw with like, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog or Halo or like all these things where people get involved yeah, positive things can happen, but it's also like the, a lot of these movements are are started by people who don't even care about the property. They just want to say things, you know? So it's hard to know, like, yeah, if they hire this guy, or is this person who made this this issue, are they even going to watch the show? You know, like, it's hard to say. But again, I do love LeVar Burton, so I think that he has the charisma and the power to be an excellent Jeopardy host. He seemed right at home doing the show on the episodes that he was allowed to do. I really think he would be good. Now, sometimes you just, you shouldn't overthink these things. You should not overthink these. Not everything, mind you. I yeah. mean, sometimes there are individuals that, oh, I want to be in the Marvel Universe. And Marvel will say, you know what? We can't, I don't think it's a good right idea. And you know what? It, well, it's a lot of times ultimately ends up being the best idea. But with this, it just seems like that, there's so much of a clamoring for LeVar Burton. I really think that he would be the best choice. He does have the best background to me as far as from a learning capacity, the way he's able to relate to audiences, both young and old. Yeah. I just think that a lot that of people grew up with him. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it just don't overthink it. Don't overthink yeah. it, Jeopardy. I mean, it just, you have an individual there that is beloved by millions of people that would probably, if he was named host, would keep people tuning in week in, week out. I mean, if you're just looking for someone that's trying to replace Alex Trebek's shoes that looks or appears or sounds or anything is resembling Alex Trebek, I think you're in a losing proposition because nobody can really replace Alex Trebek and the work he did for so many decades as the host of Jeopardy. I think if you brought something different to the equation, with LeVar Burton, who probably, and from what I've seen in the episodes I was in, approached it from a little bit different vantage point. And just his, the way he, he was on the show, just was, to me, it would be a breath of fresh air. It would just be something that I think would be really, really good and really, really instrumental in keeping Jeopardy as one of the preeminent shows out there. Yeah, yeah, I I absolutely agree with you. I guess the big question here is, does LeVar Burton even want the job? Like, I haven't read a lot of interviews with him, and I know a lot He's of... been clamoring for the job okay. for even before he was named a guest host. He want, he was begging online to go ahead and have, tell Jeopardy to give him a chance. Yeah, so. okay, because I know, uh, you know a big issue with these like fan movements also, too, is the fact that they get all the power behind these people, and then the studios approach them, and it turns out that they're not really like that interested in it, so... It's a, you know, we've seen this time and time again with Hugh Jackman, right? And people saying, yes, he's going to be in the next Avengers film. He goes, no, nah, I'm good. No, the, LeVar Burton definitely wants to become the host and, and be the permanent host for Jeopardy. Let's hope that the folks behind Jeopardy change their minds and go ahead and give LeVar Burton a chance because I think it would be a bonus for the show and it would try to alleviate a lot of this controversy behind who's going to be the next host of Jeopardy going forward. What are your thoughts out there on who will be the next host of Jeopardy? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. And if you phrase it in a question so that we have to answer it like you do on the show, even better, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. But my friend, it's been a great episode. Can't not thank you enough for joining me as always on today's program. Once again, we're going to be talking about what if on Friday's show with me and Jamie Monroy. Looking forward to it, plus a ton of other great stuff in the world of pop culture as it happens. But before we head on out, my friend, Disney showed off its first video on what they are going to put out there in regards to the hotel slash Galactic Cruiser. It's an actual Disney hotel that'll be at the Orlando Disney World location is star wars based 
It's a two day, two night adventure, allowing you to encompass many of the roles in the Star Wars universe. You could be a part of the Rebel Alliance. You could be part of the First Order. You could be a smuggler. You could you could live one of those various facets of the Star Wars universe lore. So I want to hear your thoughts on a two day, two night adventure. Are you ready to go and be part and step aboard Disney's Galactic Cruiser? That sounds exhausting. <laughs> I mean, two days. You can just chill and oh, if you want to. Oh, okay. All that, right. That's, See, that's an option for you, but that's more they will my go ahead. Speed. Yeah. Yeah. I go what, ahead, what I think Disney needs to yeah, I mean that's that's cool. I mean, I I imagine, you know, Disney doesn't really cut corners, so it'd be a pretty cool experience. You know, I'm sure there'll be like lightsaber training and all that stuff, but It'd be cool if they had like rooms set up to mimic some of like the big Star Wars sets. You know how you you like walk into the the Mos Eisley Cantina or well, that's what they're doing. Okay, see that's something that would be cool. That'd be cool. I don't know if I'd want to do like Jedi training or whatever. Like I don't want to do organized programs, but I would love to go into a place like that and just hang out, have a drink or something. But well, these will be things that you can do optionally that that give you like adventures to go and things yeah. to follow. Like let's say uh, you know how you do a murder mystery, you go there some murder mystery dinners and all that. Those you know, those those performances, though you can actually become part of those performances in a Star Wars fashion. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that sounds cool. Is that something that you'd be interested? in? But real quick, what if what if Disney teamed up with Jeff Bezos to take this experience into space? Well, that's a uh, thing for another day to talk about. That would be <laughs> awesome. But I think right now it, the pricing is like it's on outer space because, my friend, if you want to go and, and this can, you got to go to Disney.go.com. You got to go ahead and sign up and show your dictate your interest. And because the Galactic Cruiser, aka Disney Star Wars Hotel, is going to be opening sometime in the spring of next year. And in order to do that, you're going to need to dish out some bucks, my friend, because at the very least, you're looking at probably seven or eight hundred dollars per person per night with most of the thing, you know, with, I guess, a starting price tag for an entire stay because you cannot stay just one day. It's a two day, two night adventure. That's pretty much cut and dry right there whichever the rooms that you choose because they have a basic room they have a middle room and then they have a mid-tier room and then they have a higher classroom uh, an upper classroom or whatever and they got a good better and best type scenario for the rooms but you're still talking for the minimum at least four thousand dollars plus for your stay mm -hmm. so i want to hear your thoughts on that that's for a minimum on that and so I was looking at the pricing and going, man, for two days, two nights, four grand a pop at the minimum. That's a lot of credits, Star Wars or not. Is this like, uh, are we talking $1,000 in galactic credits or? We we're just talking cold, hard cash, my oh, friend. Oh, geez. I, I don't have that kind of, uh, I don't have that kind of income, you know, I'm, I'm I can't go to a galaxy far, far away when most of my money goes to just like staying here <laughs> where I am. <laughs> this is true, my friend. But yeah, if you're interested, it's on the Disney website now. You can make advanced reservations because Disney's Galactic Cruiser, the Star Wars theme hotel experience, a two day, two night adventure, which you can be a part of one of the stories of the Star Wars universe that they throw at you. Or you can just enjoy the atmosphere, your choice. You can be a part of that for a lot of money, but it is available to sign up right now. Go ahead, check it out. And if you are interested, we'd love to hear your thoughts on why you would want to be part of this adventure on if you're, you know, the, the financial costs and, the, and just basically the weighing the costs and the benefits of it. If you're looking to go ahead and step onto Disney's Galactic Cruiser, we want to hear your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been an outstanding episode. I cannot thank you as always for being part of it. Any last thoughts on the way out? Yeah, we do not have any emails to read today. I did not do a good job at production today prepping because I was at Comic-Con. But uh, we'll be back with some email reads next week and some sweet, sweet videos that will uh, will pop up on the screen here as we're 
casting because I'll be a better producer next time. Oh, you're fine, my friend. But yeah, if you got any thoughts out there, please, we want to hear you. We respond. We're very good at that. We can read it on the air. We do whatever we can to go ahead and take care of you at popculturecosmos at yahoo.com, at popculturecosmos on Twitter, popculturecosmos on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you go ahead and check us out. We truly appreciate you being part of the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the Pop Culture Cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great Dr. Geek here with another reminder that the ESO Network is pro-science and pro-vaccine. We urge you to be a superhero and protect yourself, your family, and your fellow geeks around the world. Don't be fooled by the forces of evil and their anti-science misinformation campaign. Consult the latest CDC guidelines, your doctor, and get the COVID vaccine today. So, Brittany, Martha... <laughs> Tell me about your podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like we're in sync, but also kind of a disaster. We are always a disaster. So our podcast is fun if you want to hear two people talk about and complain about stuff that <laughs> they love and also hate. And drink. And drink. And the show is Thanks. called? Oh. <laughs> but, but first, let's, let's talk, talk nerdy. nerdy. You can find us on the ESO Network. Bye-bye. See you next Tuesday. <laughs> You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.